Good afternoon. I welcome you all to this session. The panel discussion today is Minority Report. Uh, the panelists for discussion, we have uh, Harun Kali, who's not with us today, and uh, he, was, he wasn't able to make it. Uh, Kiki Daruwala, Rakshanda Jalil, Asma Jahangir, and Nirupama Dat. The moderator for this session will be Samir Arshad Katlani. A recipient of Sahitya Academy Award and Commonwealth Poetry Award, Kiki M. Daruwala has published about 12 books, mostly poems, and a couple of fictional works. Some of his important works some of his important works are Under Orion, The Keeper of the Death, Landscapes, A Summer of Tigers, and The Minister for Permanent Unrest, and other stories. He has also edited two decades of the Indian poetry. I speak into this. Writer, critic, literary, and historian Dr. Rakshanda Jaleel has published over 15 books like Invisible City, Liking Progress, Release, and Other Stories, Loving Change, a literary history of the progressive writers' movement in Urdu, a biography of Urdu feminist writer Dr. Rashid Jahan, A Rebel and Her Cause, and a translation of 15 stories by Intizar Hussain, The Death of Shahrzad. She runs an organization called Hindustani Awas. Devoted to the popularization of the Hindu Urdu literature and culture. Asma Jahangir is the elected president of the Supreme Court Bar Association of Pakistan and was elected twice as the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. Also, a director of the AGHS Legal Aid Cell, which provides free legal assistance to the needy. She was instrumental in the formation of the Punjab Women Lawyers Association in 1980 and the Women Action Forum. She has authored two books and five papers. She's been the recipient of a number of international and national awards, amongst them Raman Maxisi Award in 1995. Nirupama Dutt from Chandigarh is a poet, journalist, literary, art critic, and a translator, and writes in Punjabi and English. She received the Punjabi Academy for her anthology of poems, Ik Nadi Sanwali Jahi. Her poetry anthologies have also come out in English and Hindi. Her translations include Stories of the Soil and The Poet of the Revolution. She has written the biography of the Dalit activist and the singer called The Ballad of Man Singh. Books edited by her include Our Voices, an anthology of Sark poetry, and The Half Sky and The Children of the Night, two collections of Pakistani short stories. Samir Arshad Katlani is the journalist with the Times of India, where he commissions, edits, rewrites new stories. National politics, South Asia with Pakistan in particular, are his main areas of focus with human rights, Kashmiri minority affairs, etc. His forthcoming books, sorry, his forthcoming book focuses on humanitarian disaster in Kashmir and puts its historic perspective from the vantage point of having grown up in the valley. Over to the panelists for the session. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this. Uh, it's not working, Mike. Not working. How does it work? Mine is. <laughs> you look down. Would you? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, important session on uh, Minority Report. We'll be discussing about uh, minorities in South Asia. And uh, we have an eminent panel. All of them have been introduced here. And we have a special guest from Pakistan. She is an inspiration for uh, human rights defenders from across the world. And uh, uh, she uh, uh, is, is, is well known, as I said, uh, about her uh, human rights. Uh, particularly, she has done it against all odds in Pakistan. It's always great to have you in India. Welcome. And she has recently uh, won the Alternative Nobel Prize. Many congratulations. Mike is not still working? Can I use that? I always thought you should be getting the Peace Nobel Prize. Is this working now? Yeah, she has uh, recently won the uh, Alternative uh, Nobel Prize. Many congratulations, Asma. And uh, she is indeed a very... Uh, deserving winner of, of that award, having uh, done commendable work uh, for vulnerable sections of our society, uh, minorities and, and women in particular. Though I must emphasize that uh, with the general uh, deterioration in law and order, weakening of the state, and, uh, and other problems in Pakistan, 
and, and with this uh, monstrous terror organization, the Taliban. So every section in that society is vulnerable. I'm sorry. So we'll talk Mr. about, uh, talk about all these issues. And uh, coming uh, back to India, we have had just a change in government a few months back. And uh, the, issue, the elections were largely fought on uh, issues of development and good governance and perceived corruption of the last uh, uh, previous Congress government. But in a country like India, where religious polarization has long been used as an effective tool for political mobilization, divisive uh, issues are never completely out of the picture, particularly in the run-up to the polls. We had, as you know, uh, had Muzaffar Nagar riots just before the elections. In which 60 people, largely Muslims, were killed. Tens of thousands of people were displaced, and they continue to remain displaced. Uh, two of the main accused in uh, Muzaffar Nagar riots were, uh, were elected as, as members of parliament. And one of them has recently been, uh, been booked for inciting violence elsewhere in uh, UP. Uh, the prime minister, who is in US right now, where he couldn't go for a long time for the reasons well known, for, uh, uh, but uh, to his credit, he has made all the right noises. But his own party people do not seem to be listening to him. You must have been following the recent uh, bipolar uh, uh, elections in Uttar Pradesh, where uh, you had a five-time MP who uh, is known for, his, uh, for inciting violence against minorities, was made the star campaigner for the bipolar elections. And uh, luckily, uh, it did not seem to have much impact. So we will talk about these things. And, and separately, there are, there, there are, like during the previous NDA government, there, are, there have been attempts to rewrite history. And in Chhattisgarh, in particular, 50 Gram Sabhas have passed resolutions seeking a ban on the entry of non-Hindu individuals and organizations into their villages and prohibiting the practice and propagation or preaching of any other religion except Hinduism. So we'll be uh, talking about all these issues uh, with our panelists. Let me start with Rakshanda Jalil. Uh, Rakshanda, uh, why should we be surprised? Uh, uh, you know, the divisive politics is back in, 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 uh, in our polity again. And why shouldn't BJP go back to uh, this uh, old tested formula that, uh, you know, uh, turned BJP into a two-member party in the 80s? Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it achieved power uh, through this religious mobilization, your views. I, I don't think divisive politics uh, uh, was ever away, so I'm not sure if it's right to say that it's back. I think it's been pretty much a fact of life for us for the past 80 odd years. Even in the years leading up to the partition, divisive politics was a fact of life. I think it's something we lived with in the public domain. Uh, the only difference that I see, and for, with this government, it seems to be a honeymoon period. It's early days yet. But even so, possibly the only way in which they differ from the Congress uh, is uh, the fact that they are so unabashedly uh, insistent and keen on a polarization and uh, the fact that they do not see anything wrong in despite occupying the positions that they do in in speaking in a very polarizing way to my mind that is startlingly new uh, the ek bharam tha ek lihaz tha ek parda tha you know and us parde ke piche se baat hoti thi i think the only difference now between the congress the 10 year rule of the congress and uh, if we don't want to go way back into history but just the past 10 years and now the, the one startling difference to my mind seems to be this complete lack of, I mean, the gloves are off, as it were. And uh, the recent, uh, uh, the recent bipolar results, I mean, this uh, in, in Bihar first and then in Uttar Pradesh, this divisive, pol pol uh, pol uh, you know, this uh, mobilization doesn't seem to have worked. Does it hold out any hope? And, uh, you know, I. I wouldn't be able to answer that directly, but what I feel is, as Rakshanda said, that this divisive politics has always been there. And, uh, you know, the difference is that at least Congress kept the pretension to secularism, to, you know, which one feels threatened um, with Modi heading the BJP. And uh, coming to power in such a big way and also, you see, uh, 
not its its history, but I remember going to Gujarat uh, soon after the killings in uh, Gujarat, and I met a poet of the city. My area is more literature and art, and I was covering what the artists had done. So I met this poet, a very senior poet who had been, you know, uh, with the Maharaja of Baroda, and so. Soon after all that, uh, he got a letter saying, come and participate in the communal harmony uh, poetry reading. So, you know, so he said, I, I, I don't understand communal harmony. You can kill me on the... Uh, so this kind of thing which the faith is definitely shaken. And... Uh, one wonders what will happen, um, polarization of the communities. Again, a Gujarat incident, I remember. The painters had reacted to the violence. And I met this uh, painter who was a Gujarati Hindu. And she said, maybe things would have been different. Uh, you were mentioning uh, love jihad and how Muslims. Yeah, backstage. If the Hindu Keep it closer. Yeah. She said that, uh, you know, she had a classmate when she was in the MS University, Baroda, and she wanted to, she liked him very much. But she said the message from home was that marry anyone, but you are not to marry a Muslim. So this kind of uh, division has always been there. And uh, in Punjab, this was not there between Hindus and Sikhs. You know, the marriages continued, even through the years of tension. And so one wonders what will happen. So, uh, Mr. Daruwala, why, why blame BJP alone? I mean, Congress, Samajwadi Party, uh, they, they feed into each other. I mean, there seems I'd to be like to, Firstly, I'd like to express my, uh, what shall I say, gratitude that I'm here and that I'm a part of such a prestigious panel which includes Dr. Rasma Jangir and Dr. J Rakshanda Jalil and Nirupa Mandatji. Thank you very much. I think we need to take the discussion at a slightly different level. There, there has been divisive politics in India and in the entire subcontinent. That time, the subcontinent was India after 1857. And uh, we don't have to go that far back in history. Another point I wish to make is that the globe is turning towards a global citizenship. It's not confined to, you know, minorities. Uh, the thirst, thrust worldwide is towards a universal citizenship. And the minority question and the safeguards and privileges demanded need a theoretical framework. I'm not into riots at the moment, though I have visited possibly every important riot during the last three years, I'd like to tell you. I can talk about them, but I'd like to talk a few other things. And the other thing is the tremendous reservation that has come into the polity of India. And it started in the 90s with the Mandal Commission. I remember I came back from England after four years and uh, we couldn't move on the roadside. Uh, each street protective of its spawn closes on the intruding fly. Each caste under a separate roof. Each class under a different sky. That was the India I came back to. And uh, this, uh, we are becoming slowly a dole demanding, a reservation demanding, people across the country. Even amongst the Parsis, people have come to me. And I said, sorry, out, out. We don't need reservations. Uh, work hard, and you'll get into colleges. You will get into institutions. If you can't work hard, just forget it. There are some other points I wish to make, just to take the discussion uh, a little away from uh, a riot here, uh, 
or a love jihad there. That is, is there a meeting ground between minority rights and nationalistic concerns? You see, there is a lot of propaganda from the far right, and I wish to pinpoint that. Number two, how does equality of opportunity blend with reservation quotas? Three, can minority rights gel with individual rights? I mean, we have to think about all these things. Four, do minority cultures disadvantage nation building and vice versa? They don't. I mean, without uh, federalism and democracy, cannot be called democracy and federalism if minority rights are not respected. This paper. Uh, if group differentiated rights prevail, are we cramping the space for majority? We are not. We have an 85% majority. How are we, uh, how does this 15% uh, or the 12% because uh, when we talk of minorities, I regret to say we only talk about the Muslims, who are a sort of a second majority in the country. How are they impinging on the majority rights? Uh, and what about minorities that don't add to vote banks? The trouble about the minority question is it has got involved with vote banks. And uh, that is also a dangerous, a very dangerous thing. I do feel that the people who propagate love jihad are actually, or talk about uh, love jihad, are actually propagating a uh, hate jihad. And this must be remembered because all sorts of uh, slogans can be thrown at a community or at a people and the regretful part is that they very often stick. Asma, how do you uh, how do you see the winds of change uh, in India from uh, from Lahore before we uh, come to minorities in Pakistan? Well, let me put it this way: that I would not like to compare India and Pakistan. You have the luxury of calling yourself a secular state. You had the luxury of democracy for too long. We said unfortunately and regrettably that we are a theocratic state. We've had dictatorships. We've had dictatorship in the name of Islam. And therefore, the repression on religious minorities is very obvious, it is very brutal. However, we recognize it. Those people who at least stand for human rights and social values of equal opportunity recognize it. What sometimes I find a bit, I'm a bit dismayed, dismayed sometimes in India, is that you do not even recognize the ills in your society. There are two issues, I think, where I would like to pick, it, pick threads from there. One is the question of affirmative action of religious minorities. I very strongly believe that they ought to be affirmative action for religious minorities. I do believe, though, that it can be and it does get exploited by the more powerful within that religious minority itself. And I'll give you Pakistan's example. Our uh, very infamous dictator Ziaul Haq, who called himself the leader of Islam, and was probably the foulest man subcontinent has seen. He actually promoted and introduced a separate electorate system in Pakistan in the name of rights for religious minorities. And that separate electorate system meant that a Hindu could vote for a Hindu and a Christian for a Christian, Parsi for Parsi and so on and so forth. And the people who were leaders of these religious communities were very happy. I have to tell you this, because they felt that now they have an opportunity to sit in the parliament, not realizing that at the grassroots level, this separate electorate was, and this I take your point, is taking religious minorities out of the mainstream and compartmentalize them. So if something happened to a Christian in a small village, 
the Muslim representative would say, go and find your Christian representative who was sitting thousands and thousands of miles away. And he was really not concerned so much about his own community as he was concerned about pleasing his own political party or pleasing those people who actually nominated him to this seat. And therefore, it was not really helping the community. It took us over six years to actually engage with religious minorities and to convince them that this was not in their interest. And finally, we now have a joint electorate system, plus we have affirmative action for religious minorities, so they have their seats and they can also participate in the mainstream elections. Now we are taking it to the next step, because we have to break the monopoly of the upper caste, of the upper caste not only Hindus, but the, but the elitist amongst the Christian community. Yeah. Was about to come. And more importantly, that the women within religious minorities suffers the most. For example, a Hindu woman in Pakistan has far less rights than a Hindu woman in India. And in the past, not now, but in the past, a Muslim woman had far less rights in India in family laws than a Muslim woman in Pakistan. And I see some of the judgments of the high courts and supreme courts of India on what they call Mohammedan law. And I am quite appalled that they had not modernized and liberalized it to the extent that our very shabby judges of Pakistan were able to do. But because they were a majority religion, they could play uh, with the rights of women in a more positive way, because they were not going to be hung like what happened uh, many years ago in the case of uh, Shabanu case with Justice Chandrachud's judgments. So I think that the one, one is that we have to take, this is, this is an issue that is far more complicated than really taking positions one way or the other. But I think that what we need at the end is to see that certain actions that we are taking, will it reach our objective? And the objective must always remain mainstreaming religious minorities. And I would 100% agree that if any system is introduced that eventually takes them away from the mainstream, that needs to be corrected. But we do need affirmative action for religious minorities. In our part of the world, and I see that not only us, but India, Sri Lanka is also now uh, experiencing this, that religious sentiments are now being provoked on legal plane. And why I say that is that in India, the states that have anti-conversion laws have far more communal rights than those states that do not have anti-conversion laws. And I have always held this view that to introduce a law is, an, especially when it's made in the name of religion, is again something that you have to look at very carefully. Because once you introduce something in the name of religion, it's very difficult to take it away. Even the UK, for example, had blasphemy law, which was innocuous, but it took them many decades to get rid of that law. I see that in, uh, Bang in uh, Sri Lanka, when there was a draft law on anti-conversion, riots took place between Buddhists and Christians in Sri Lanka. Once the government decided that this law is not going to be enacted, the riots stopped. You look at the example of Orissa, for example. Now, riots between the Christians and the Hindus took place much more after anti-conversion laws were introduced. Or for that matter, if you look at other states of India where riots between Christians and Hindus took place. So my point is that to introduce religion in, in legislation is a very dangerous uh, step. We have, of course, seen the worst of it, where blasphemy laws have been introduced gradually, not just 295A and B that you have here, 
we've now gone on to C, and I hope we don't go on to D. And we have death penalty, mandatory death penalty for anyone who defiles the name of the Holy Prophet directly or indirectly through innuendo, through gestures, spoken words. That by itself has stopped all debate on religion. It has asphyxiated all kind of discourse on religion. And it has put not only religious minorities, but hundreds and hundreds of Muslims, and I'm very unhappy to say, a large number of people who are mentally challenged have been arrested and convicted under this law. So I frankly am of the opinion that religion needs to be played down rather than played up. I cannot, if you allow me, get away from saying something that I just said to my friend Sunil, that ever since I've come to India from Amritsar to Delhi to Mumbai to here, I hear a counter narrative in India which I had not heard before. And the counter narrative is, so what if BJP has come in? If BJP has been accused of killing Muslims in Gujarat, well, the Congress did the same thing in Amritsar, and the Congress did the same thing to Muslims in Mumbai. So my answer is, then you better look up, because you are no longer a secular state. If your two main parties are seriously accused of killing and massacring religious minorities, so what you are saying is, Something that I have discovered today, that Congress was as bad as what happened in Gujarat, that's a very sorry state of affairs for India. Though I dare say, I think you need to correct your narrative, because I do know that we are in far worse condition than you are. But when that statement comes out from Indian intelligentsia, it really makes me sit up and think whether you're accepting it, whether you're saying it's the done thing, whether you're saying, well, that's the way we are really, we've just given ourselves another image. So the answer is for you to give me. I'm, I'm looking for one. Rakshad, you wanted uh, to add Asma. something. Asma, I think we, we remain a secular state because uh, secularism is enshrined in our constitution. And I think the con Justice Leela Sait is here and other people here would know that this is, uh, I think secularism is an article of faith for many, many of us many of us Indians. And uh, picking up the idea that both of you sort of raised of uh, locating minorities in the mainstream, it leads me to wonder why we in the first place need a Ministry of Minority Affairs. Do, do we not as citizens have sufficient faith in the Constitution which protects everybody's rights, including the minority rights? And I think there has been a, a, a small a group of, uh, there, there has been a school of thought that has talked about doing away with the Ministry of Minority Affairs in the first place. Because what is it but a disbursement agency for funds? You see, uh, a lot of these schemes, uh, to my mind, seem to be uh, funneled towards whether they're education schemes or whatever. So uh, perhaps, Mr. Darawala, you might want to pick up this idea, why do we need a Ministry of Minority Affairs in the first place? You see, you can have the best laws in the world, and we have excellent laws, an excellent constitution, but what about the implementation? And there's the rub, because implementation, especially in our country, is quite faulty. And the implementers are very often themselves corrupt, partial, both. I mean, uh, I was asked by the chairman, uh, Mr. Samir, just now about what I thought of the, uh, the implementation by the police. I feel the police in this country, and I've been to riots in Assam, in Rajasthan, in uh, a lot of other places, uh, including uh, Uttarakhand, and I find the police is biased. It has absorbed the propaganda from the far right. I won't spell out the far right, but I uh, understand, uh, and you all understand whom I mean, uh, that uh, torrent of propaganda uh, which, to which they have been subjected. So 
I would blame the law enforcers. I would even blame the administration. I went to a riot scene in Rudrapur where the Quran Sharif had been uh, burnt and, you know, mixed with the usual thing, uh, pig flesh, etc. And uh, I said, uh, I asked the district magistrate, and the district magistrate said uh, there were um, pages in Arabic, but uh, we wouldn't know whether it was from the Quran. So I said, do you have an Arabic press in a place called Rudrapur? So the administration, uh, whether it's uh, people at the level of uh, district magistrates uh, and otherwise, uh, for example, in Gopalgarh, where 250 shots were fired on the mayors and not a single shot was fired on the Gujas with whom there was a fracas. Uh, there, they had no, they had, uh, the district magistrate uh, was there. And when we submitted our report, the district magistrate the superintendent of police and the additional superintendent of police, all three of Bharatpur were suspended. So uh, implementation leaves a big gap and you, you can have the best laws in the world. If the implementation is not good enough, uh, there's very little you can do. And the, uh, the bias, the bias, the communal bias, which is there, which is filtered down into society. So don't blame the, implemented, the implementers and the government alone. We all are equally responsible. You, you raised a very important point about uh, implementation. So you can have the best constitution in the world. But essentially, you've had, uh, since 1947, you've had riots after riots. And there have been inquiry commissions after. No, uh, there's hardly any uh, inquiry commission or the recommendations have been uh, adopted. Essentially, it boils down to the bureaucracy and the political class, which is actually going to implement the spirit of the Constitution. So that's also very important. Yeah, I mean, yes, but um, the, even the national commissions appear to be largely toothless. I mean, they present their reports, but what happens to them? Okay. So these, uh, there have been other issues apart from uh, uh, violence and, and other issues. There have been these... Uh, uh, Garba, we were, we were talking backstage about Garba. So these cultural, I mean, the, it's getting into the cultural, uh, these, these, these little melting pots which we, which we, which we have still. So they are, they are getting into these. Your views on, on, on something like uh, Garba where, where they are asked, you know, specifically asking uh, the, the members of the ruling party that, that keep Muslims away and, and, and blatantly playing this communal politics. Yeah, it seems to be a portent of things to come that if this is not stemmed in the bud, my sense is that this will uh, become worse, this kind of very sort of clear picking up of people. Mm. And uh, uh, in a state like Gujarat, where the Garba was something where people went to, mm. and for, for, but I believe the uh, chief minister has now said that there will There's be no a such thing. Official, uh, yeah, uh, so there is an official uh, dictat. Yeah, that, that yeah, this, yeah. This will not be yeah. uh, allowed uh, to yeah. happen. Yeah. And coming back to uh, Pakistan, Asma, uh, I read your uh, interview just a while back. And uh, I've been following you for years, and you have never sounded so optimistic about your own country when uh, people outside your country uh, are increasingly losing hope. What is the reason for your uh, newfound optimism? I think I'm growing old. <laughs> I believe, and if you read all my uh, statements and interviews of the past 30 years, I am an incorrigible optimist. And I'll give you the reason why. My father spent almost 14 years in jail. And every time a dictator used to come in power, our house was like an open adda where people would walk in and walk out and discuss politics. And I used to hear him tell people, you know, flap his fingers like that and says, one month is gone. Two months is gone. And one day, my mother got very tired of it. She said, you've been saying that for five years to these poor people. Two months, three months. So he said to her, listen here, if I believe that and made people believe that this man who's come, this ferocious man is going to be here for another 10 years, then we would have lost hope. So we have to hope that this oppression will go. So I always hope this oppression will go. I'm convinced of it. And when you say, why am I optimistic? When you look around, 
Pakistan is one country which has not let its dictators stay there for 22 years. What you have not appreciated about Pakistan is that the day a dictator comes in, people are rounded up and taken to prison, and street protests start from day one, not day two. I have seen in my youth 14-year-old boys being hung in Kot Lakpat jail while their sister was sitting with me, a political activist, and she was raising slogans for freedom. That Pakistan you have not seen. That Pakistan I have seen. When we as women, young women, came out in the streets, 150 of us, we were beaten black and blue, but that, you've seen photographs, but that was not hurtful. Believe me, what was far more hurtful was the next day when our married lives were all, uh, you know, distorted, when we were called prostitutes, when we were called that we, we are having affairs, when we were told that they want their girls to sleep with people. That was hurtful. And we decided no matter what is said about us, we do not care, we must continue, because the first thing about a dictator is to give a dog a bad name and then hang them. And I'll, we learned this very early. Today, we are not considered women who are teaching young women promiscuity. We are considered as leaders of women's movement. And I think there is a difference. There is a difference because when I was young, people would not come to visit me because my father was in the opposition. So I had only one friend whose father was also in the opposition. So she came to my birthday and I went to her birthday. <laughs> but today, people will come to visit you. Civil servants will talk about politics, will disagree. There is freedom of expression in Pakistan. You may agree with the press or not agree with the press, but those that have fought for the freedom of press, I think even a bad press is better than having no press. Today, young women are working in our country. When I started practice, there were three of us. Today, there are thousands of us. And we used to go with our shoulders like this. The young girls who come into the profession come like this. So I have hope. I must have hope. People are empowered. People have a voice. And very recently, that's what you want me to say, and I will. Very recently, we have seen that Pakistan went through a crisis, and it was a very touch and go crisis, believe me. That Saturday, I was leaving for Norway for a very important occasion for myself. But I canceled it because we were absolutely certain that martial law would be imposed and many of us would be picked up. And that I could not be away while my friends would have been in jail. But what did we see for the first time in our life? That people stood on the side of a democratic transition. Not on the side of the government, but they wanted a democratic tr transition because they equated a democratic transition to stability, which is what they used to equate to earlier with military dictatorships. So military dictatorships today in our country are considered instable governments and people's governments are considered to be stability. So at least now I don't have to argue in drawing rooms, which I have done for decades, that democracy is better than dictatorship. I don't have to argue this. But sadly, another thing that has also happened in Pakistan, I'm sorry if I'm taking a little bit more time, but you can ask me to wind up, is that what I find is that the upper class, highly educated class of Pakistan does not have value for democracy. They don't need democracy. They like dictatorial, demo, undemocratic rules because they can come in bilaterally into power. They don't have to go to the dirty old thing of this Baradri. Now, these are realities of our country. 
or to Gujars or this one or that one and ask for their votes. They want a phone call from the presidency saying, please come and take over as minister so and so. So they are all there to disrupt this system because they have been recipient of a system that was very arbitrary. And there is a class that has come up over the years in Pakistan, which I call the Pakistan Time class. We used to have one newspaper, government newspaper called Pakistan Times, which gives you all the disinformation. So this is the apolitical class of our country, very well read. And sometimes when I hear one of our very so-called radical leaders who is out there in the container nowadays, talking about the history of Pakistan, I hold my head in my hands, because this is precisely the history that they've all read in HSN College in Lahore. It is so distorted, the history that says that Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah was the best Muslim in the subcontinent. It is a history that says that Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a good Muslim and that's why he had a Muslim state. And that Gandhi ji himself was a very secular man and therefore there is secularism in India. Although I have often thought that Qaeda Muhammad Ali Jinnah in his personal life was more secular and gave birth to a theocratic state. Whereas Gandhi ji in his personal life was very Hindu and gave birth to a secular state. Now, I find that dichotomy strange in myself. But these are, there was a lot of prosperity, they will tell you, during Ayub Khan's time, but they don't talk about disparity. They skip over East Pakistan, because that's what they were taught in HSN College. East Pakistan never happened. We have won all the wars against you. You have taken our part of the Kashmir. We'll fight with the sword till our dying day. So. This is the kind of history that our upper class has read. A bit of hate, a bit of truth, and a bit of exaggeration, and a bit of glorification, which is quite unnecessary. So I find that this is a very interesting time in Pakistan where the upper class is challenged, and they are partnership with the deep state. And it's the middle class and the poor people and those that have always fought for democratic rights have now gained partnership with this middle class and the ordinary people of Pakistan and for the first time got empowered to say we will not accept, we cannot accept military dictatorship and the people have said no to military dictatorship. Can I not be optimistic now at this age of my life when I see that? I would like to say something, you know, inspired by Aspa and the tale of two countries, uh, where we are feeling the intelligentsia and the middle class, uh, you know, why we are feeling dismal, and they are, is that I have been very closely going to Pakistan, watching, writing about Pakistan, is that the resistance which the activists and the intelligentsia is showing in Pakistan is sadly dwindling in India. And uh, as Aspa again said that religion should be played down, the past few decades on popular media, television, we have just seen religion being played up like anything, including and women's rights being, uh, you know, trampled over, including our present education minister who played the ideal Bahu and if, you know, Ganesh Puja starts, it goes on in the serial for one week. Then so one, uh, one, one Diwali. Mr. rightly pointed out that this, uh, uh, this you know, debate, uh, debate over minorities in India is essentially gets, uh, you know, tied with, with Muslims and Christians. Yes. And, and you were telling me about Dalits in Punjab. Dalits and in Punjab. Uh, also, uh, also, I feel concerned about the liberals. In Pakistan, I came across a very interesting thing. No, I want to say this, even though it's a little deviant. Um, you know, we are... Uh, the young people, the slogan of uh, BJP of economic growth sold so well. 
you know, they are no longer concerned about issues as minorities. And this is, this is very painful. You know, you could be one exception, there could be three others. Within media, in Delhi, newspaper offices, journals were nervous during elections that which editor will change, which uh, journalist will have to be sacked. A Muslim boy working in a newspaper was terrified, half Muslim, that what is going to happen to him. So you see, yet economic growth, making more money, going forward in life, this is what is concerning. No, no, I'd like you to speak about Dalits in Punjab. You were telling me about, I mean, these issues never get, uh, you know, discussed. And also this... Uh, before we wind up for yeah, audience yeah. questions. Uh, in Punjab, you know, uh, I, we were discussing it, that who is the minority in Punjab? Uh, you know, it's not always religious minorities. The minority in Punjab is other Dalits, you see. And uh, they, the Dalits uh, are known to take on the religion of the people they are working for. You know, if the... Uh, landlord is Muslim, they become Muslims. If the landlord is Sikh, they become Sikh. Uh, and one case I recall, there's this, uh, uh, I went to Lahore and there was this woman working in someone's house and she read the Khadi Gramadiyo Kurta. She could read Hindi. So I asked her, she was the sweepress, that how come you know Hindi? She says before this, we were, you know, Hindus. So, then why did you become a Muslim? She says, what difference does it make? Oh, why didn't you go to India? She says, we would have carried shit there, we are carrying shit here. So there are, there are those kind of people also, which we must think of. Now you were telling me also about the serious rights violations of, of Dalits. So uh, is, is, isn't the... Uh... Uh, the Dalits, uh, there again, there is an interesting thing, which Mr. Daruwala said, that I tell people, work hard, get out of it. Uh, you know, the two untouchable communities, as everyone knows, would be, which were counted untouchable, were Chamars and Churas, we call them in Punjab, uh, sweepers. So, the Chamars were tanners, you know, they dealt with animals, they had these skills. In Punjab, both these communities worked as landless labor, they were on the mercy of uh, the judge Sikh landlords, and their women were exploited. Now the sweepers had no skill, whereas the chamars had the standing skills, you know, they could deal with animals. When the sports industry came up in Jalandhar, they moved into stitching footballs, making this, making that, and gradually, or setting up small shops, gradually they were out of the uh, domination of the uh, landowners. Whereas the, ch the lowest community, the Mazhabi Sikhs, we call them in Punjab, they had no skills, they continue. Uh, landless workers, the ba wages in a prosperous state like Punjab are 2,000 rupees a year. Or 2,000 2, rupees uh, for a quarter or something. Very, very ridiculously low. And uh, so this, and the transition of this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Chamars is to be something to be washed out. Uh, you know, there was this case, I don't know if you all know, there was a shooting case in Austria, in the Gurdwara, where, you know, one of the... He was a, a leader of the, um, the Chamar, the, they are also called Ramdasias, their leader, who was killed, because gradually they have moved out of the Sikh Gurdwara, the upper caste Gurdwaras also. And sadly, we have caste-based Gurdwaras in Punjab, a religion that uh, stood against caste. But they have been able to come out of it. They have moved abroad as labor. They've made money. And this is how the scenario has changed. Now, we can have some questions from the audience. Uh, my question is uh, about political majorities and how they affect minorities. Uh, Keki Daruwala said that there are plenty of laws uh, to protect minorities in India. Um, problem is they don't get implemented. 
I disagree. If you look at that period when Rajiv Gandhi from 1984 after his mother's assassination won a gigantic minority, a majority in parliament, the worst actions against minorities were enacted in parliament by his party. I'm talking about the Shabanu case and the demolition of the Universal Civil Code for Muslims, followed by opening the gates of the Babri Masjid. The Congress Party was responsible for both. If you fast forward to 2002, the Gujarat riots, that terrible atrocity against uh, Muslims, the same thing, Narendra Modi's brutal majority in his state. So should it surprise us that with this fantastic minority that the BJP has now arrived this year in a majority, I beg your pardon, in parliament, the minorities will again be under siege. So it's the lawmakers that persecute minorities, not just the law. Would you like to Please. respond? I just, uh, like, I just, I just like know, to add something before. You know, the thing is that it's not only the lawmakers, it's us. We are there to stand up. We don't stand up. Well, who is to stand up for these atrocities that take place? The public is to stand up. If the public doesn't stand up, nobody is going to help us. We have to stand up. That's the thing. Uh, but in the Shabano case, there were hardly any protests. Who knows? I mean, you know, as always, something can be said on both sides. But uh, why did they, uh, Sunil, why did they succumb to the Shabano case? because they were catering to the fundamentalist majority or the fundamentalist fringe amongst the Muslims. Let's face facts. And it was a political act. The vote bank counts. We can't lose the Muslim vote because of Shahabanu or because of ch change in um, you know, personal law. So that will always be there. Politics will always be guard, um, guided to an extent by this, and uh, why, why are we talking about only the majority? What about all these years when eight states in India have promulgated uh, anti-conversion laws, which um, Asma Jangir um, mentioned? And they are terrible because the Constitution allows conversion. Personally, if you ask me, I would not. The majority doesn't convert in this country, so why should we have conversions? But if they are sanctioned by the Constitution, how dare a state come up almost with a law going contrary? And the restrictions, you must wait for one month, you must appear before the collector, you must get a police report. I mean, what is all this nonsense? A religion is a matter, a personal okay. matter. If tomorrow I want to become a Copt or a Mormon, uh, I should be able to become one. Sunil, to add to what you were saying, I think the government wishes to engage with, uh, you know, what I call the loony fringe, which is the, the more clamorous voices. You see, I, I think... Not engage, promote. You see, the, when, they, when, when there is talk of a dialogue, it is never with sane people like us here, for example. The jokers in costume who project a certain point of view. And my sense is that that much more acceptable to the government than the so-called saner version. Yes, but there is something have to do with the otherization as well. You know, they can't imagine you and me yeah, as, as, as the other. Yeah. So that's part of the problem. More questions? Uh, in, in, in India, I've read three horrifying accounts in three books of three Kashmiris who were jailed at the Tihar jail and the torture they've gone through I mean, they managed to come out, but what happens to them after that? And then the news reports that, you know, uh, 10 Muslim boys picked up, acquitted after eight years. What happens to them? I mean, we just don't question this. We don't even talk of the jail population. Can I say? Gaon, where the right people have now been uh, thrown into jail, and, uh, yeah, okay. you know, the same happened with the uh, Charminar, um, bomb explosions, the Mecca Masjid uh, bomb explosions. The Johota, our justice system grinds very, very, very slowly. 
and uh, not very exceeding fine. <laughs> My question is regarding the how like in our country, if you talk about almost many rats, basically I'm from Bihar and I, I have saw the situations where these rats taking place. So initially it starts between Hindu versus Muslim. But after a point of time, it turns administration versus Muslims. Because the way the administration acts and entire thing. And more than that, I have problem with, like, when you talk about whether it's Islamic fundamentalism mm -hmm. or Hindu fundamentalism. Like, when it comes to Islamic fundamentalism, I really feel very shocked when so-called Islamic liberals, they didn't come in open and they s spoke it out. Because what I think, if you have to deal with Islamic fundamentalism, it's the Muslims who can deal it with better. Or I think, when it comes to Hindu fundamentalism, it's like liberals like you and us can deal with it. But the problem is that we always go just back to it. Because what I think in this uh, South Asian subcontinent, whether it's India, Pakistan, no matter how much by thought we can be liberal, but when it comes to religion, we try to be so narrow. Why? Well, from the question that you asked, if I've understood it properly, is that why don't we challenge religious extremism, whether it's Hindus or and I think that you're absolutely right, that we all know the problems. We, are, we all are victims, all these countries are victims of religious extremism and of persecuting our religious minorities one way or the other. Whether you are secular or whether we are theocratic, whether you are degree nine and we are degree 34, that hardly matters. But I think that this will continue to happen because of precisely what the young man has said. And I think he made a very good point that it starts with two communities fighting, but then it ends up with the minority community fighting the state itself because the composure of the state somehow is affiliated more to the majority group. And in some ways, it is also politically inexpedient. For example, what Rajiv Gandhi did with Shavano case, if Muslims have 100 votes, 50 votes are of women. So he certainly must have lost about 20 votes there amongst the women and at least 10 points amongst liberal Muslims as well. So it's when you even count in terms of number games, politicians can be sometimes in their opportunism uh, not that savvy about being political in this matter. But what I wanted to say in response to you was that we have argued and we have cataloged number of incidents that both you and particularly us in Pakistan are ashamed of and the treatment that we have made meted out to religious minorities. But what is the answer? And I think that in a very long-term answer, which we must at least work together as South Asians, not just for Pakistan and India, but also for Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Myanmar and Nepal and Afghanistan, is to one day set up a regional religious rights commission. And that commission should not only look at each of the incidents, but should be guided by not now new principles that our leadership brings out, but by Article 18 and 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which means that they're not only looking at religious rights, but also incitement uh, against uh, incitement in the name of religion, to kill someone should also become an offense, which is not such a proper offense either in India or Pakistan. And then we should be looking at things like prevention, deterrence, justice, which is very important, and solutions, and also sometimes mediations. And we've seen that sometimes when you are seeing that something is brewing up, mediation is also part of prevention. And there, civil society can play a very good role. And we have had incidents where many riots have been stopped because people have intervened and been able to bring sense to those who think that they could have got away with murder. 
and now they see that the other side has people who will stand with them and somehow the police also as you say the administration also backs off so i think that these are larger issues where we need larger partnerships and coalitions to build towards if you're talking about regional peace regional peace will never come unless we do not end religious intolerance and religious intolerance cannot come in each country separately it has to come together so we hope that whatever asma jahangir has proposed materializes so on thank you so much for for joining us thank you thank you that was a wonderful session uh, i request the uh, uh, panelists to um, sign on the blf wall yes this year blf is not simply about the written word we have the festival uh, we have at the festival a wonderful showcase of the contemporary art and sculpture bangalore literature festival in association with our venue and hospitality partner crown plaza bangalore electronic city proudly presents form faces forces an exhibition celebrating motifs and emotions that bring books alive created and conceptualized by galax Ga gallery g the exhibition is at the crown plaza hotel lobby as well as in the festival area crown plaza is hosting an opening of the exhibition at their lobby today at 6:30 pm with complimentary wine and appetizers please do stroll over to the hospital lo hotel lo hotel lobby at the end of the final session of the day while the grounds are being fogged The concert of the wonderful bon Bombay Jayashree will begin shortly afterwards. Those who wish to get their books signed, please head to the signing area. Thank you. <laughs>